Dan Hi Miss Lynn. Hi. How's everyone? Fine, thank you. Fine, thank you. Good. Excuse me. Don't forget to sign in for your attendance. I signed in three times with the next floor with your name on them. You want to make sure I know you're here. Yeah. <laughs> I put up some uh, vocabulary words with pictures, for especially for the students that were not in class yesterday. We're starting a new story, the cask of Amontillado. So just real quick, let's go over the words again. Amontillado is a pale, dry wine. The second word is aperture. An aperture is a hole or opening in something else. As you can see here, the kittens, the kittens are looking out of the aperture in the wall. The next word is cask. Cask is also another word for barrel. It's what they keep the uh, Amontillado, the wine in. The next word is carnival. Uh, you can basically cross out the word Europe because the carnival is in uh, other places besides Europe. My state, Louisiana, has the largest carnival of the year every year, okay? Anyway, a carnival is a large festival or a celebration. A catacomb. Basically, a catacomb is an underground cemetery. The next word is circumscribed, which means limited. These men are circumscribed by their ability to leave. In other words, they're in a very small jail cell. Clamor means a loud sound. The horns created a clamor. A connoisseur. A connoisseur is an expert or judge in the matters of art, food, or wine. The next word is embed. Embed means to enclose closely in or to bury. 
Example, fossils are embedded in stone. The next word is fettered. Fettered means to be locked or chained to something. Then we have the word flambeau. Flambeau is a burning torch. The next word is incrustation. It means a hard outer layer that covers something. Like if you, you can barely see on these dishes, but there's like uh, 24 karat gold around it. They're encrusted with this gold. The next word is obstinate. It means stubborn or refusing to yield. In other words, a, a stubborn person or thing. Preclude means impossible. This object precludes logic. It's logically impossible. A quack. Quack is not uh, a real expert. Part of uh, some people might say I went to a quack doctor. Meant he was really a bad doctor. They doubted he was really a doctor. Of course, terminate means to stop or end. And then the next word we have is tier. A tier is a row or level. You can see the man laying bricks here in tiers. A trowel is a flat bladed hand tool. This is what the bricklayer uses to uh, put the cement on the bricks in order for them to stick together. The tool is called a trowel. And the next word is utter. Utter means to pronounce or make a sound. You've heard maybe teachers say, do not utter a word, do not speak. And a virtuoso is a person skilled in the fine arts, such as music, acting, or painting. Do not get virtuoso and connoisseur confused. A connoisseur is an expert or judge in the matters of art, food, or wine, okay? He doesn't necessarily, uh, here you, let me show you the difference. He's not necessarily into me uh, or she into music, acting, okay? A connoisseur is uh, an expert in judging art, uh, things of that nature. A virtuoso is a person that plays music or does the painting. So make sure you understand the difference, okay? Are there any questions so far? Please unmute yourselves. No, thank you, Ms. Lynn. Oh, no, thank you're you. You're welcome, man. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Lynn. You're welcome. And of course, I will put all of this on the SMS. Don't worry. Okay, I have to go to a new screen. Just bear with me. Uh, miss, can we revise on the story of the sound of thunder? The sound of thunder? Sure, what do you need to know? Like the from the port that uh, when they went uh, to their uh, journey to the past. Uh huh. The, um, the important detail that happened there. Oh, wait one second. Let me find the story. Oops. Okay, 
exactly what page, baby. One second. Okay. I'm on page 36 right now. Is it before or after? <clears throat> From 37? Page 37? Or, okay. Or until uh, 41. 41. Okay. So on page 37 of the very first paragraph, they're in the time machine and they're going back in time. And he says, first it was a day, then it was a night, then a day, a night. And then he starts telling about the decades that they go through, all the way to 1957, gone. So we know they continue going back, 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 okay? Uh, they put on their oxygen helmets to help them uh, breathe. And they tested the intercoms out to make sure that they could hear each other when they talked. Uh, it describes Eccles as sitting on his padded seat. His face is very pale because he's at this point, he's very nervous. And it also tells us about the four other men in the machine. Travis, who is the safari leader and his assistants, his assistant is called Lesperance. And then there are two other hunters, Billings and Kramer. And during the whole trip going back in time, they just basically sit there and look at each other as the years pass through, okay? And then Eccles asks, can these guns get a dinosaur cold? And Travis tells him, if you hit them right. And he explains that some dinosaurs have two brains, one in the head and another one far down the spinal column. He said, we stay away from the, those, that's stretching our luck. He said, put your first two shots into the eyes if you can, blind them and go back into the brain. So the machine keeps going and Eccles is sitting there and you know he says, think, every hunter that ever lived would envy us today. They would be jealous of us. This makes Africa seems like Illinois. So then the machine starts to slow down and it's noise falls to a murmur and then the machine stops. All right, but the, the fog that surrounded the machine goes away and they are back into a very old time. Three hunters and two safari heads with their blue metal guns, okay? Travis tells them to just think, Christ isn't even born yet. Moses has not gone to the mountain to even talk with God yet. The pyramids in Egypt are still in the earth, waiting to be cut out and put up. He said, and remember that Alexander, Caesar, Napoleon, Hitler, none of them even exist yet, okay? And Travis also tells him to look that this is the jungle of 60,000,000 and 55 years before President Keith, okay? And at this point, he points out the metal path that goes off into the wilderness, okay? And he says, that is the path laid by time safari for your use. And he describes how it's built. It's six inches above the earth. And he tells them, do not touch so much as one grass blade, flower, or tree. It's anti-gravity metal. Its purpose is to keep you from touching this world of the past in any way. Stay on the path. Don't go off it. I repeat, don't go off for any reason. If you fall off, there's a penalty. And don't shoot any animal that we don't okay. So right here, we can see this is already foreshadowing trouble, right? Yes. Okay, so then Eccles, after uh, Travis tells him all this, Eccles says, why? And uh, Travis goes on to say, we don't want to change the future because we don't belong here in the past. 
the government does not like us here. They don't want, he, the government doesn't want us here, okay? Can y'all see the pictures on your screen? No. Okay. No. <laughs> All right, wait one second, sorry. Okay, can you see it now? Yes, yeah. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Lynn. Sorry about that. I had to let Debelina and off it in. All right, so uh, Travis goes on to tell them that they don't belong there. The government does not like us here. He says, we have to pay big graft to keep our franchise. A time machine is finicky business. Not knowing it, we might kill an important animal or a small bird, a roach, a flower even. If we do that, we could destroy an important link in a growing species. Yes, Bamika. Yes, I wanted to ask how, uh, why did he compare Africa to Illinois? Oh, he said this makes Africa seem like Illinois. How were they dating? Because, okay, Africa, you know, Africa is a big country and you go there to hunt big game animals today, okay? So he's saying this makes Africa seem like Illinois. I, I presume that's the state of Illinois is where they are according if you read this. So he's comparing Africa to Illinois because when they finally get there uh, in the jungle where they're going, uh, he compares that to Africa. You understand what I'm saying? There is no difference between them in the past. Right, exactly. Everything looks the same. Right. Okay. You understand, Bumika? Yes, thank you. Oh, you're welcome. All right, so after he explains all this to Eccles, then Eccles says, that's not clear. So Travis says, all right. For example, we accidentally kill one mouse here. That means all the future families of that one mouse are destroyed. And all the families of the families of the families of that one mouse. With a stamp of your foot, you annihilate first one, then a dozen, then a thousand, a million, a billion possible mouse, mice, I'm sorry. Do you understand that part? Yes. For example, if, if your father, if you're the only son to carry on your family name, you're the only one left in your family with the family name, okay? and something happens to you and you don't have children, then your family name stops. You understand? Yes, miss. Uh, are y'all with me? <laughs> yes. Okay. Yes, yes. I thought y'all had left me. So it's the same thing with killing, for example, a mouse. If you kill that one mouse, then you destroy all of them, okay? So Echo said, so they're dead, so what? Trevor says, what do you mean, so what? Well, what about the foxes that need those mice to survive? For the want of 10 mice, one fox dies. For the want of 10 foxes, a lion dies because the lion eats the foxes. This is examples. For the want of a lion, all manner of insects, vultures, infinite billions of life forms are thrown into chaos and destruction. Stop and think when a lion dies, you have many, many, many different kinds of insects and vultures that eat off its dead body, right? And as disgusting as it sounds, we need those insects and those different vultures and life forms in the world, okay? So Travis says, eventually, 
it all boils down to this. 59 millions later, a caveman, one of a dozen on the entire world, goes hunting wild boar or saber tooth tiger for food. But you, my friend, have stepped on all the tigers in that region. And by stepping on one single mouse, so the caveman starves. And the caveman, please note, is not just any expendable man. The caveman is an entire future nation. For example, he would have maybe had 10 sons. Maybe those 10 sons would have had 100 sons and on and on. You understand? Yes. Okay. Yes. So when you destroy this one man, you destroy an entire race, an entire people, an entire history of life. It's comparable to killing some of Adam's grandchildren. You know, Adam and Eve. Yes. Okay, where we all came from. So if some of his grandchildren would have been killed, we would not be here. Does everyone understand what, what I, exactly I'm saying? Yes. Okay. Yes. So the stomp of your foot on one mouse could technically start an earthquake, the effects of which could shake our earth and destinies down through time. All right. He says, with the death of that one caveman, a billion others yet unborn are throttled or killed in the womb. Perhaps Rome would have never risen on its seven hills. Perhaps Europe is forever a dark forest and only Asia waxes healthy and teeming. Step on a mouse and you crush the pyramids of Egypt. Step on a mouse and you leave your print like a Grand Canyon across eternity. Maybe Queen Elizabeth would have never been born. Maybe George Washington would never have crossed the Delaware, okay? Finally, Eccles says, oh, I see. Then it wouldn't pay for us even to touch the grass. And Travis says, that's correct. A little error here would multiply in 60 million years, all out of proportion. But then again, he says, of course, maybe our theory is wrong. Maybe time cannot be changed by us, or maybe it can be changed only in little subtle ways. A dead mouse here makes an insect imbalance there. A population disproportion later, a bad harvest, further on a depression, mass starvation, and finally a change in social temperament in far-flung countries. Now, if you look at this literally, you can see everything that I just told you happening in the world today, right or wrong. Countries have bad harvest, their crops don't grow, there's mass starvation in some countries. What about social temperament in countries? People are protesting. They don't like this. They don't like that. Hannah, you have a question? Yes, uh, I had a question about uh, when they say Rome rises and never rises on its seven hills. Why, why yes. seven hills? Because Rome has seven hills. Y'all probably haven't studied that yet. But you'll, you will study and you'll discover the seven hills of Rome. Yes, thank you. You're welcome. So, like I said, you, we see mass starvation in some countries. We see temperaments of uh, flare in some countries. Okay, right or wrong? Yes. So if you think about that, what he's saying even connects to us today is uh, uh, on earth, okay? All right, perhaps he says only a soft breath, a whisper, a hair, maybe pollen, so, something so slight changes 
that unless you looked really close, you wouldn't even see it. Who knows? Who really can say he knows, okay? We don't know, we're yeah. guessing. He tells him, but until we know for certain, we can't mess around with this. So we have to be extra careful. That's why they sterilize their clothes, their bodies, and everything they can do to keep from bringing uh, germs in. So then Eccles says, how do we know which animals to shoot? Travel, Travis explains to him that Lesbris, today before our journey, we sent Lesbris here, back with the machine. He came to this particular era and followed certain animals. Eccles said, studying them, and Lesbris says, right. He's told him that he tracked them through their entire existence, noting which of them lives the longest. And he discovered that very few. He also discovered that how many times they made it, he found out not very often. He, so the conclusion was their life was short. So he told him that when he found one that's going to die, when a tree falls on him or one that drowns in a tar pit, that he notes the exact hour, minute, and second. Then I shoot a paint bomb and it leaves a red patch on the animal's side. He says, we can't miss it. So then I correlate our arrival in the past so that we meet the monster or the dinosaur not more than two minutes before he would have died anyway. He explained in this way, we kill only animals that have no future, that are never going to mate again. This is how careful we are. So do you understand that part? These animals, yes, these animals would have died anyway. They were too old and either a tree would have, fell, would have fallen and killed them or they would have fallen in a tar pit and drowned. So they were going to die anyway. They were old. It was their time to die. So he goes back and he tracks these kind of animals. And when he finds these particular animals, he shoots them with a paintball gun and leaves a mark on their side. Okay. So then Echo says, but if you came back this morning in time, you must have bumped into us, our safari. How did it turn out? Was it successful? Did all of us get through alive? And at this point, Travis and Lesbris just look at each other because I'm sure they're thinking Eccles is an idiot, okay? So Lesbris says, that would be a paradox. Time does not permit that sort of mess, a man meeting himself. When such occasions threaten, time steps aside, like an airplane hitting an air pocket. You felt the machine jump just before we stopped. That was us passing ourselves on the way back to the future. We saw nothing. There's no way of telling if this expedition was a success or if we got our monster or whether all of us, meaning you, Mr. Eccles, got out alive. At this point, they're getting very aggravated with Eccles. So, Eccles smiles, and Travis says, cut that. Everyone on his feet. They were ready, now ready to leave the machine. So they step out, and they see that the jungle was high. It was very big. It seemed to go on forever and forever. And they could start hearing these sounds, almost musical-like, of flying tents fill the sky. And those were pterodactyls, soaring with cavernous gray wings, gigantic bats of delirium and night fever. Eccles, balanced on the narrow path, aimed his rifle playfully. This makes Travis very angry, and he shouts, stop that. Don't even aim for fun, blast you, if your gun should go off. So then Echo's face turns red and he says, where's our Tyrannosaurus? Lesbris looks at his watch and he says, up ahead. 
will bisect this trail in 60 seconds. Look for the red paint. Don't shoot till we give the word. Stay on the path. Stay on the path. So then they start moving forward. Echoes murmur strange up ahead 60 million years. Election day over, Keith made president, everyone celebrating. And here we are a million years lost and they don't even exist. The things we worried about for months, a lifetime, not even born or thought of yet. So Travis then orders them and tells them safety catch catches off everyone. You first shot Eccles, second Billings, third Kramer. Echo says, I've hunted tiger, wild boar, buffalo, elephant, but now this is it. I'm shaking like a kid. Ah, said Travis. Everyone stops. Travis raised his hand. Ahead, he whispered in the mist. There he is. There's his royal majesty now. The jungle was wide, wide and full of twitterings and rustlings and murmurs and sighs. Suddenly, it all stopped, as if someone had shut a door. Silence, a sound of thunder. Out of the mist, 100 yards away, came Tyrannosaurus Rex. It, it, shh. It came on great, oiled, resilient, striding legs. It towered 30 feet above half of the trees, a great evil god folding its delicate watchmaker's claws close to his oily reptilian chest. Each lower leg was a piston, a thousand pounds of white bone sunk in thick ropes of muscle, sheathed over in a gleam of pebble skin like the mail of a terrible warrior. Each thigh was a ton of meat, ivory and steel mesh and from the great breathing cage of the upper body, those two delicate arms dangled out front. You know, you've seen pictures of these big dinosaurs. However, their arms are tiny. Can you picture one standing up and holding his tiny little arms in front of it? That's what it's describing here. It's two tiny delicate arms dangles out front arms with hands which might pick up and examine men like toys while the snake neck coiled and the head itself a ton of sculptured stone lifted easily upon the sky its mouth gaped exposing a fence of teeth like daggers its eyes rolled ostrich eggs empty of all expression save hunger it closed its mouth in a death grin. It ran, its pelvic bones crushing aside trees and bushes, bushes, its taloned feet clawing damp earth, leaving prints six inches deep wherever it settled its weight. It ran with a gliding ballet step, far too poised and balanced for its 10 tons. Remember this animal weighs 10 tons. It moved into a sunlit arena, warily, its beautifully reptilian hands filling the air. Why, why, Eccles twitched his mouth. It could reach up and grab the moon. Shh, Travis jerked angrily. He hasn't seen us yet. It can't be killed, Eccles pronounced this verdict quietly, as if there could be no argument. He had weighed the evidence and this was his considered opinion. The rifle in his hand seemed a cap gun. We were fools to come. This is impossible. Shut up, his Travis. Nightmare. Turn around, Commander Travis. Walk quietly to the machine. We'll remit one half your fee. We'll return one half of your money that you pay. I didn't realize it would be this big, said Eccles. I miscalculated, that's all. And now I want, it sees us. There's the red paint on his chest. The tyrant lizard raised itself. Its armored flesh glittered like a thousand green coins. The coins crusted with slime and steamed. In the slime, tiny insects wriggled. Remember, this animal is already dying. 
This is why insects have already started eating it, okay? That's why it's slimy. In the slime, tiny insects wriggled so that the entire body seemed to twitch and undulate, even while the monster itself did not moved, move. It exhaled the stink of raw flesh, blew down the wilderness. Get me out of here, said Eccles. It was never like this before. I was always sure I'd come through alive. I had good guides, good safaris and safety. This time I figured wrong. I've met my match and admit it. This is too much for me to get a hold of. Don't run, said Lesperus. Turn around, hide in the machine. Yes, Eccles seemed to be numb. He looked at his feet as if trying to make them move. He gave a grunt of helplessness. All right, any questions? Now, this next page is when Eccles turns to go to the machine and uh, Lesper shouts, Eccles. So Eccles takes a few steps and Lesper says, not that way. At this point, the monster at the first motion lunged forward with a terrible scream. It was so fast it covered 100 yards in six seconds. The rifles jerked up and blazed fire. A windstorm from the beast mouth engulfed them in the stench of slime and old blood. The monster roared, teeth glittering with sun. Eccles, not looking back, walked blindly to the edge of the path, his gun limp in his arms, and he stepped off the path and walked, not knowing it, in the jungle. So, did the dinosaur get shot before or after Eccles stepped off the path? After. After. Are you sure? Just make sure. His feet sank into green moss. His legs moved him and he felt alone and remote from the events behind. The rifles cracked again. Their sound was lost in shriek and lizard thunder. The great level of the reptile's tail swung up and lashed sideways. Trees exploded in clouds of leaf and branch. The monster twitched his jeweler's hands down to fondle at the men, to twist them in half, to crush them like berries, to cram them into its teeth and its screaming throat. Its boulder stone eyes leveled with the men. They saw themselves mirrored. They fired at the metallic eyelids and the blazing black iris. And then like a stone idol, like a mountain avalanche, Tyrannosaurus fell. Thundering, it clutched trees, pulled them with it. It wrenched and tore the metal path. The men flung themselves back and away. The body hit 10 tons of cold flesh and stone. The guns fired. The monster lashed its armored tail, twitched its snake jaws and lay still. A fount of blood spurted from his throat. Somewhere inside, a sack of fluid burst. Sickening gushes drenched the hunters. They stood red and glistening. The thunder faded. The jungle was silent. After the avalanche, a green peace. After the nightmare, morning. Billings and Kramer sat on the pathway and threw up. Travis and Lesperus stood with smoking rifles, cursing steadily. In the time machine on his face, Eccles lay shivering. He had found his way back to the path, climbed into the machine. Travis came walking, glanced at Eccles, took cotton galls from a metal box and returned to the others who were sitting on the path. Clean up. Okay, we have less than a minute. If you have not read the rest of the story or you need to review it, to see what happens at the end, then you need to reread this part. Are there any questions so far? No, thank no. you, Mr. 
Okay. What do you want to do the next session? Do you want to continue with the cast?